Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar for December, the last webinar of 2020. Uh, just to give you a heads up, the next webinar will be on the first Wednesday in February. Uh, we will not be having one in January because there's not much reporting over the festive season. Well, we've come to the end of a tumultuous year. Uh, obviously, mainly dominated by the black swan event of COVID-19. Also, there have been all the Trump excesses through the year, trade war with China and so forth, and now, of course, his vanquishing as a result of the election. Add to that massive fiscal and monetary stimulation of the US economy this year and many other economies, including our own, with probably more to come, we believe that it's very important for you to be able to see this in context. Now, we have spent a lot of time developing a document that explains our background approach. It's on our website under the About heading, and it's just called Our Background Approach, and it gives, us, it gives you our perception of the context of markets. Where are we now? On your screen, you can see the S&P 500, and what you will notice is that yesterday, last night, it broke to a new all-time record high uh, and closed at 3662, so that's a new all-time record high. And obviously, uh, this is a bull trend, and it's been in a bull trend for, in our opinion, uh, nearly 11 years, uh, since March of 2009. And um, we regard the, we regard the uh, COVID-19 downward trend, which occurred earlier this year, as an aberration from a technical perspective, because it was not caused by, it was not caused by economic factors. Rather, it was caused by a black swan event, something completely unpredictable and not related to the state of the American economy or world economy. In our article on the 13th of March 2020, when we were right in the thick of that downward trend, we predicted that the downward trend would be a V-bottom, that there would be a very rapid recovery, and we pointed out that the bear trend, that that bear trend was not a normal bear trend based on economics. Technically, as far as we were concerned, it was always an aberration, a downward spike within an overall long-term bull trend that had started in March of 2009. Now the V-bottom of the COVID-19 bear trend is over and done. And uh, you can see now that because we are reaching new record highs, it was clearly not a normal bear trend. Bear trends normally last anything from 18 months to three or four or five years. This one was all over in about six months. So why were we so confident that COVID-19 would be a short aberration? Mainly because it was not driven by the economics of the situation. When investors saw that, the end, that COVID was approaching its end, or as soon as they started to perceive that, the bull trend resumed, the underlying bull trend resumed. But now, of course, it's massively amplified by a new round of monetary and fiscal stimulation. But where does this great bull market come from? What is its origin? We believe that it's important to go back, study the history, and get a good understanding of the context within which you are looking at the S&P 500. To do that, we've got to go back to um, an economist, a Russian economist called Nikolai Kondratiev, who in 1925 wrote a book called The Major Economic Cycles. And in that book, he outlined a 54-year cycle of commodity prices, roughly 54 years long. And that 54-year cycle, he traced it back 300 years himself. But subsequently, economists have traced it back over 3,000 years. In fact, it's mentioned in the Hammurabi, Hammurabi Stele, which dates from 1754 BCE, about three and a half thousand years ago. And it's also mentioned in the Old Testament. 
Kondratiev predicted the 1929 crash. He's credited with predicting it, and he predicted it in 1925, four years before it happened. But we believe that the Kondratiev wave is actually a cycle of debt. It's not a cycle of commodities. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that throughout history, debt levels have built up and built up and built up, and then there's been a massive clean-out. And every 54 years, that clean-out takes place. It seems as if the economy needs that to happen in order to function normally. We believe that this corresponds with the economically active lifespan of the average man. A man becomes economically active in his 20s and ceases to be economically active in his 70s, usually. For example, my father was born in 1915, and he lived through the Great Depression. Nobody who lived through that Great Depression could have come out unscathed. And he would have no debt. He had no trade accounts. He had no overdrafts. He wouldn't get any uh, loans of any kind at all. If we didn't have the money, we didn't buy it. It was as simple as that. So he was completely against any kind of debt because of his ex experiences as a young man during the Great Depression. But of course, he's, he's passed away now. And by 1985, he was in his 70s. You see, the Great Depression was a mammoth event. Wall Street in the 1929 crash fell 89%. It fell to literally 11% of its peak value. And it took two and a half years to do that. At the end of that two and a half year period, unemployment had reached 33% in America. You had doctors, lawyers, architects, engineers, professionals digging ditches in order to make money to feed their families. Nobody is left today who had first-hand experience of the Great Depression. And that, of course, sets the scene for debt levels to start rising again. By 1987, the U.S. Govern government's deficit had reached $3.5 trillion, which was a record level and at the time seemed enormous. Every generation seems to have to learn for itself about debt. So once the people with the experience of 1929 and the Great Depression passed out of the system, the way was cleared for a new build-up of debt. And then, of course, in 1936, John Maynard Keynes, the economist, wrote his book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money. And what he said in that book is that the Fed had handled the October 1929 crash badly. He said that they had adopted a tight monetary policy and that actually caused banks to collapse, making the downward trend and the depression worse. What they should have done was to inject funds to compensate for the wipeout of wealth in the stock market. Alan Greenspan, who became governor of the, of the Federal Reserve Bank, in 1987, I think, in 1987, yes. He was an avid student of John Maynard Keynes. Of course, in 1987, Ronald Reagan was in his second term as president. He was nearing the end of that term, and he was faced with a 23% fall in the Dow Jones. A single day, 23% fall. Just to put that in perspective, in 1929, October 1929, on Black Monday, Wall Street fell 9%. So this was more than double that fall. And of course, he was very afraid that there would be a Great Depression. So he got hold of Greenspan, who'd just been appointed to office as governor of the Reserve Bank, and he got, his, and he got him in and he asked his advice. And Greenspan said, don't worry, I'll be able to solve this problem and I'll solve it quickly. What Greenspan did was that he got all the G7 countries, the biggest countries in the world, to pump massive amounts of money into their economies, and he did the same in America. The results were dramatic. The S&P turned around in March 1988, just six months after it had crashed, and 18 months after the crash it broke a new record high. Alan Greenspan became a legend. After his success, every downtrend since then has been treated the same from a monetary policy point of view. 
throughout his time, which lasted until 2006, and then with his successors Bernanke and Yellen and now Powell, all have done the same thing. There's a problem, however. In the 1980s, it took tens of billions of dollars to uh, it injected into the economy to turn it around. In the 90s, in the dot-com crash of the 90s, it took hundreds of billions. And then, of course, in the noughties, in 2008, in the subprime crisis of 2008, it took trillions. In fact, the Fed actually ran out of money and had to print it. And they developed a new euphemistic term for that. They called it quantitative easing, but it is, in fact, just printing the money. Altogether, after 2008, central, bank, central banks around the world created, printed, and injected more than $12.5 trillion into the world economy. And of course, throughout this period, debt levels have just carried on rising. Um, if, if you go to the uh, website, the National Debt Clock, uh, I think it's .org, but if you look up the National Debt Clock on the internet, the U.S. National Debt Clock, there's a terrifying website there which shows the deficit of the United States actually growing in real time. Right now, that deficit is $27.3 trillion, which is a very far cry from where it was in 1987. And of course, America has injected further cash into its economy, driving the U.S. economy. And the U.S. economy was already booming before COVID-19. And they're continuing to stimulate it even further. And I'm sure that Joe Biden will have a new stimulus package, probably somewhere around $2 trillion, to inject into the economy as soon as he is confirmed in office. And that will especially be true if he gets to control the Senate in America. And that is why the bull market continues and why we were so confident, even in the throes of the COVID-19 collapse, that this would be a V-bottom and that markets would recover very quickly. And as you can see, they made a new record all-time high there uh, last night. Of course, there is a second wave of COVID, which we're all aware of now, taking place particularly in Europe, but also in America. And that may have a dampening effect on the economy and therefore on the markets. But of course, that is being opposed by the development of vaccines. There are about nine different vaccines which are being developed. All of them are talking about a 90% effectiveness. So that is the background to the current position of the S&P 500. China, of course, is showing remarkable growth and the European economy has been growing quite strongly as well. And those are driving the markets up. If you look at the chart here in front of you, the S&P 500, there you can see the previous cycle high, which was at 3580. Underneath here, I've got the 200-day moving average, which I use all the time. And you can see it's sloping upwards and has continued to slope upwards for the last six months. This is the, the uh, period of uncertainty about two months before the election, uh, characterized by volatility and sideways market. And then when Biden won, you can see the euphoria surrounding his win here and the strong upward move. And then on the 9th of uh, November, we had an interesting candle. This candle is, is very close to being a shooting star. A uh, shooting star is normally a negative candle. In other words, it comes at the top of a steep upward trend, which you can see we've got here. And it's a candle where the upper shadow, which is this line here, is twice as big as the body of the candle. In fact, in this particular case, the upper shadow is, a, is not quite twice as big as the body. Anyway, at the time, I was a bit concerned about that. I thought it might, there might be a downtrend, and indeed the next day the market was down. But it has subsequently recovered and consolidated above this 3580 level here, as you can see on the, on the chart. And now, of course, we've moved off that consolidation into a new upward trend. Of course, the American economy has done better than most economies as far as COVID-19 is concerned. 
American GDP is only expected to fall by 4.4% in 2020. That compares, of course, with South Africa's 8% fall. The UK is expecting a 10% fall, Japan 5.3%, and Germany 6%. So America has done far better than other countries. Even though the pandemic has been very badly handled in America. But the reason for that is that America is not hugely impacted by international trade. It might come as a surprise to you to learn that only about 12% of American GDP comes from international trade. So that, that compares massively with Germany, where almost 50% of their GDP is in, from international trade. So America is sort of insulated from COVID-19, far more insulated than other countries. Of course, you must also remember that Biden has chosen Janet Yellen as his Treasury Secretary. She is the lady who used to be Governor of the Reserve Bank, and um, she's got enormous experience. In fact, the general characteristic of Biden's team that he's appointed is one of great experience. Okay, let's turn now to the South African economy. I'd like to just first of all talk about debt. Tito Mboweni has said that we are now in the danger zone, that the debt level in South Africa is in danger of rising above 100% of GDP and that that is unsustainable. And he says that if we do not implement reforms, then we will have a failed state like Ecuador or Greece or Argentina where they've been unable to meet the interest and capital repayments on their debt. Tito talks about the sanctity of the fiscal framework. And that basically means staying within the budget. In other words, he's done a budget. Um, he's just done the mini budget for October. And he, he's stressing the importance of remaining within that fiscal framework. And that it is a framework which has sanctity. It's something we must defend as a country. In other words, he's saying that we shouldn't embrace something like quantitative easing. And we shouldn't go the same route as Ecuador, Greece, or Argentina and become a failed state where nobody is prepared to lend us money because we do not, uh, we do not stand up for our commitments. He's talking about structural reforms, and the, word, the term structural reforms has come to be a euphemism in this country for cutting the government wage bill and controlling the union movement. Professor Michael Sachs very well-known academic in this country, says that the severe cuts to the budgets of most government departments are going to be difficult to adjust to. The Defense Department is having to cut by 9.3%, Home Affairs by 13.5%. Education is not being cut, but it's also not having any increase, which means that it will fall backwards in terms of inflation adjustment. But despite this bad news, the South African economy appears to be recovering quite quickly. We have inflation at 3%. GDP is expected to fall by 8% this year. And of course, we have record unemployment. But the RAND is getting stronger, which means that money is flowing into the country. That is having a beneficial impact on fuel prices. You've just probably seen the fuel price cut today. And also on interest rates, which seem as if they will be unchanged for the whole of next year. For those who kept their jobs, low interest rates means more available cash, especially if they've got a bond. They have, will first obviously use that cash to cut debt and build up savings, but then they will start spending, and that is obviously the, why the government is taking this policy. This year, Black Friday sales were, were up on last year, about 14%, it's estimated. And obviously that has got something to do with the lockdown and maybe it will compensate retailers for the bad sales during the lockdown. Online sales were up strongly for stores which had made the shift to online and it shows the way in which uh, business is going to be done in South Africa in the future. The ABSA PMI, Purchasing Managers Index, jumped to 60.9 um, in October from September's 58.3. It is down again this month, but nonetheless, the general trend is that manufacturing is resuming, that it is growing. And this was supported by the HIS Market uh, Purchasing Managers Index, which remained above 50. A lot of it is due to export demand, which means it's vulnerable to this second wave of the virus in Europe. 
In, in South Africa, all recoveries are basically export-led. So we export more and then our economy recovers. Unemployment, well, we created 500,000 jobs in the second quarter of this year. But then we'd lost already 1.2 million in the first quarter. Inevitably, some businesses have gone bust. Others, the stronger ones, have remained and they are obviously taking up the opportunities left by the businesses that went under. So it's created opportunities for startups and for survivors. The survivors are those who had strong balance sheets and a good business plan. The second wave of COVID, which seems to be impacting on the Eastern Cape, is a bit concerning. From 167 cases in, in, at the end of October, the Eastern Cape now has over 6,000. Teams of medical professionals are being sent there to help, and some of the public hospitals in the Eastern Cape have overflowed. So that is a bit of a concern. We hope it doesn't lead to further lockdowns. Rand Merchant Bank's Business Confidence Index, which is a survey of about 1,800 executives, reached the highest level that it's been for two and a half years. So that shows that some people are optimistic about the future. And all of this, of course, is discounted into the RAND. The RAND is um, progressing quite well. I just want to put the chart on the screen now for you. Right, there's the chart. And you're familiar with this chart because it's the same chart that I put up last time. And you can see the alternating periods of risk off and risk on where the international community either withdraws its funds from emerging economies like South Africa or brings money in here attracted by our high interest rates, our high real interest rates. You can see that it's been alternating risk off and risk on. And then in the run up to the election, we went into a long risk off pattern, which accelerated once Joseph Biden had been elected. And uh, it's still going on. In fact, uh, last night, um, the rand was at 15.25 to the US dollar. We expect that trend to continue. In fact, we expect that it will break below 15 rand. That will obviously impact on our fuel price and also on inflation rates here. Another positive factor for the rand has been the uh, surge of arrests, notably Ace Magashula's arrest, which have given overseas investors some hope that South Africa will be able to curtail its corruption and will deal with it. We have always said that the RAND is heavily undervalued and uh, we believe that it will continue to strengthen. Obviously, that has an impact on RAND hedge shares, which you need to be aware of. Okay, let's look at our old uh, nemesis, state-owned enterprises. Eskom reported another 20 billion RAND loss in 2020. After a similar 20 billion rand loss in 2019, the only reason it didn't get any higher, I believe, is because of the new CEO, Andres de Reta. He's been slowing down the theft of power, cutting the costs at Eskom and recovering debt from people like municipalities. He's also been organizing this concessional finance from Europe. Hopefully that comes to fruition and uh, that will help to overcome the 490 billion rand debt that Eskom currently has and also move us towards renewable energy. The next uh, major debt problem that South Africa is likely to have will come from the Road Accident Fund where currently at the moment 300 billion rand is owed in judgments that have already been given. It's estimated that by 2022 that will rise to 600 billion and somebody has to start doing something about that. All right, let's look at commodities now just briefly. The new gas and condensate find that is uh, at Leopert, in, uh, which is adjacent to the Brulpada find that was done in 2019. This is another massive boost for the SA economy over the next 20 years. It's expected to add about $1.5 trillion to our economic activity, to our GDP. It will provide moss gas with the moss gas refinery with material and it will probably ease our power problems going forward. The oil price, of course, has been impacted by, by COVID-19. If we look at the oil price, I just want to get that chart up on the screen here. Um, what you can see is that 
from the low point here where it reached $18 a barrel in April this year because of uh, international lockdowns of economies, $18 a barrel. It rose up quite steeply as the economies recovered and unlocked. And then there was this long period of uncertainty at around $40 a barrel uh, in the run-up to the election. And here you can see the Biden win and the impact it's had on the oil price has been to drive the oil price up quite strongly as investors became more confident of an economic recovery. And that obviously was also assisted by the advent of various vaccines. All right, let's look at some companies now. We, I just want to say that there are two companies that we have previously recommended that did very well. Just like to draw your attention to them. The first one is Process. Um, we recommended Process a while back, about 10 months ago. Um, I'm just going to put one year's data on the screen here, as you can see. We wrote an article here on the 29th of January this year, 10 months ago. There you can see the impact of the corona bear trend. But since then, the share has been trending up very strongly. And so far, if you had bought it on our article, um, you would be up over 50% in that 10-month period. The second share which we recommended was Afrimat. And this is a share which we've liked for a long time and which we still believe is undervalued. Um, and again, here I'm just going to bring in a little bit more data. We put an article in on, about Afrimat on the 25th of May. And since that time, in the six months that followed, the share has gone up 43%, uh, which is a very good gain. Both shares, in our opinion, are still rising. Right, now I'd like to talk about a little property company called Texton. Normally, I wouldn't be interested in a share like this, but what happened with Texton is quite remarkable um, because it's a very clear example of insider trading. Textron, as I said, is a small real estate investment trust. We drew your attention to it on the 29th of September because we, we said it was undervalued. It was at that time trading at 89 cents against a net asset value of 5 rand 80, 580 cents. That made it possibly a takeover target. Well, we were right. On Thursday, the 29th of October, which you can see here is this day, this little flat day here, it traded an enormous volume, 28.2 million shares. Now you must bear in mind that up to that point, the volumes traded, which you can see down here, were very low, about averaging about 170,000 shares a day. And then suddenly on this Thursday, the 29th of October, it traded 28.2 million shares and it traded those at a slightly higher price, four cents above the previous day. The next day, the company issued an announcement that it was the subject of a mandatory takeover, a mandatory offer for the shares at 120 cents. So the next day the share jumped to 115. There it is. So this is this volume which occurred on Thursday the 29th before the Friday announcement is clearly insider trading. There were four deals done on that day for 28.2 million shares. Somebody knew, somebody inside the company knew and decided either directly or indirectly to trade the shares. Whoever did that, by the next day, had a paper profit of 10 million rand. And you can see the shares continue to trade around, levels around at 220 cents, between 115 and 120. So they've now had time to sell out and they've made a profit of something like 10 million rand in that, in that trade. So insider trading is something which goes on in the JSC all the time. This is a very, very clear example. The people who sold their shares over here for 78 cents obviously lost that 10 million rand because they didn't have the information about the imminent mandatory offer that was coming up the next day. I haven't seen anything in the paper to suggest that the JSC is investigating this, but I really think they should. Anyway, my, my, my point to you is that insider trading is visible in the volume traded. There it is. You can see it quite clearly in the volume chart. If you use an on-balance volume, you'll see a very clear buy signal at that time. Okay, the next share I want to talk about is high prop. 
this is obviously a very well-known uh, property share on the JSE. And um, I'm just going to put a bit more data on here. Um, yeah, high prop, which has been in a downtrend for some time. And you can see the impact of COVID-19 over here. Um, what I've got on here is a 200-day moving average. And then you can see it went into an island formation. And then there's been an upside breakout. I'll just uh, take that down to two years. Uh, you can see I've marked the upside breakout there through the 200-day moving average, breaking up out of this island formation. Now, High Prop is a share which uh, owns very uh, high-quality, well-known shopping centers like Rosebank, Canal Walk, Hyde Park Corner, all these places. Uh, it's got a loan-to-value rate of 41.4% and vacancies of 2.4% after a 7.1% rental es escalation. It has been talking to people about selling Hyde Park and Rosebank. And we advised long ago to get into the share when it broke up through the 200-day moving average. Well, it's done that now. So in our view, this is a buy. The next share I want to talk about is Novus. This is the biggest printing company in South Africa. It used to have a monopoly contract with Media24 to do all its printing. Um, but that contract fell away and that caused the share to tumble. So as you can see here, the share has been falling. We recommended that, again that you put on a 65-day moving average, wait, wait for an upside breakout, and that upside breakout has now occurred. Um, so this company is trading at about one-eighth of its net asset value, and it looks like good value to us. It also has sufficient volume for a small investment. The next share that, we, that we're putting on the screen is one we really like and have liked for a long time, and that is Lewis. They are obviously a retailer of furniture and electrical appliances. Um, let's put a bit more data on the screen. You can see here that Lewis obviously also suffered during COVID. There's the downtrend. But it then made a huge uh, inver reverse uh, head and shoulders formation. There's the left shoulder here. This is the head, this big formation here. And then there's the right shoulder. And now there's the neckline, which you can draw out, joining those two points. And we've had an upside break through that neckline. And the share is going up strongly in a new upward trend. This company has 780 stores. And it does about 65.7% of its business on credit. So it's basically selling cheap furniture and appliances, mainly to the lower income group uh, lower income groups and it's doing a lot of that on credit but it's an extremely well managed company and um, it controls its debtors book very effectively the main thing about it is it, it itself has no debt at all so it was extremely well placed for the COVID-19 downward trend and never in danger it's got a very strong balance, balance sheet the company has been buying back its own shares and we uh, we have always thought that the share is a bargain it will obviously benefit from any improvement in the South African economy. Right, so folks, that's about it for uh, this month. I just take the opportunity on behalf of the staff of PDSnet to wish everyone a good festive season. Remind you again that we will be uh, on the air and talking to you again on the first Wednesday of February next year. There will be no confidential report in January. Um, because there's not much to report usually over the festive season. So we'll be talking to you then, and we wish you all the best, and have a great time, and thank you for listening.